heads up on um, what's coming up in our programming. We have uh, 4th of July's next week, so there's no program next Monday. Instead, we're doing a Wednesday, July 7th program. And on that evening, we will have a special guest, acclaimed Boston author and historian, Anthony Mitchell Samarco. And if you've ever seen these books that are like, you know, Centerville and all the little brown covered books, he does those. And he's um, going to talk about um, how history tends to repeat itself. Uh, with his narrated exploration of Boston during World War I and the disease known as the Spanish flu that decimated the world's population, a parallel to what's going on now if you're not real tired of what's going on right, right now. Um, tonight, after our program, we will invite you to uh, join us for some homemade desserts by our famous Jude Martin. And our speaker also invites you to observe some artifacts that he brought and is displayed here. I am pleased to introduce tonight the co-founder of the Cape Cod Military Museum. And I'm, t I'm told the other co-founder is here also. Can you, yeah, hi. So there's two co-founders, so one, two, um, of the Cape Cod Military Museum. And I'm told he's also, Joe is, also everyone's favorite dog trainer. So Mr. Yukna will present Gunpowder and Grease, Point, Grease Paint, the story about how the AAA Training Command Cape, Camp Edwards, the AA Demonstration Battalion Royal Art, Art, Artillery, and superstar Dennis Resident and actress Gertrude Lawrence all came together in 1943 on Cape Cod. So we would like to thank our wonderful sponsors, Diane Mahoney and Charles McMillan, who are here tonight. Thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joe Yukna. Thank you. All right, folks, my name is Joe Yukna. Um, I'm the co-founder along with Jerry Ellis of the Cape Cod Military Museum. That's us there. I never served in the military, but I was the son of a World War II Korean War veteran. That's my pop. And I'm the father of a war and terror veteran. Uh, and my interest in the Cape Cod military history started when I worked as a Department of Defense police officer at Otis Camp Edwards. So I'd drive around and they'd have all these uh, dilapidated buildings and I'd wonder what the heck, the thousands of them, what the heck happened here? Because they didn't hear much about it growing up on the south uh, Patrolling on the base, I would uh, literally see thousands of uh, World War II era buildings. I would uh, often wonder uh, what uh, happened here. When I worked in the base, I was always a little perplexed because there was a headquarters building and in a different area of the base, a headquarters section. It turns out the headquarters building was for the 26th Yankee Division and the headquarters building was for running the base. Uh, and its old headquarters section uh, is where tonight's story begins. The headquarters section is on the left on Connery inbound as you enter the base from the main gate. It's now Tactical Training Base Kelly. Housed in this section was the Anti-Aircraft Artillery Training Center, one of the largest in the country. This, uh, over 42 battalions were trained here during the war. It is really hard to shoot down an aircraft. In World War I, in 18 months, only one American pilot was killed despite the Germans and Austrians firing millions of bullets and hundreds of thousands of shells. Only one pilot was killed. The reason is that it's hard to shoot down a plane is there's so many factors. You have the speed of the plane, the direction, bullet drop, wind, and even rotation of the earth has to be configured. You could hit the plane. Uh, we started out, actually, 
with 30 caliber rounds shooting at planes. But then we moved up quickly to the 50 caliber round. And that's a water-cooled 50 caliber uh, machine gun. It's water-cooled because you could have a high rate of fire and the barrel wouldn't overheat. There's actually hoses running off it, and another guy would actually be doing a hand pump with a, with a well, uh, a bucket of water that would circulate the water through so it wouldn't heat up. There were actually many of these guns on the Cape. There was a couple starting Scusset Beach from uh, German aircraft or German invasion. The 50 caliber fired a, a solid projectile. Uh, it's aimed by a uh, line of sight and requires a direct hit to damage an aircraft. The M45 had four 50 calibers, greatly increasing the amount of fire in the, in the kill zone. And that could, that could fire 800 rounds uh, a minute. The next stage of evolution was the 37 millimeter. Oh, I'm sorry, they put the, 45, the uh, quad 45s on a half track. Uh, this is called an M16. At each end of each base uh, of the, the, the canal bridges were one of these vehicles guarding it during World War II. So the six M16s guarding the uh, bridges uh, over the canal. The next step up now is the 37 millimeter. This is a, an exploding shell that would go out and fragment and so it had a much, kill, much larger kill ratio. Uh, this is at the water where this gun was built right here in Massachusetts. And uh, it could be fired line of sight or guided by uh, a primitive computer, fire control computer. Next. The next combination, this photograph also is a Camp Evans. This is an M15, which has one 37 millimeter cannon with two, excuse me, uh, with two 50 caliber machine guns uh, mounted on either side of it. And these were used in North Africa. Uh, one of the tricks our gun is used was to fire the 50 caliber at, at enemy planes. The pilot would then think he knew the maximum range of the M15, come closer not knowing the 37 millimeter cannon range was greater. So they'd lure him in and then they would open up with the uh, 37 which had a 10 round clip. Next up was the, Bo the Beaufort's 40 millimeter cannon. Uh, it's a shell on that table over there. It shows you the size of the shells that fired in there. They're the old uh, palm uh, and they had a six round clip that you drop in gravity fed. And they could be fired uh, line of sight or by uh, a computer. Next. Then we have the three inch gun. Uh, if you look closely, you will see the end of the canal and that red little beacon-like thing is still there today. Have you ever been to Horizons of Hemispheres? Or whatever, it's, it's a, something else now. It's a brewery now. Uh, Treetop. Treetop, all right. That's their parking lot. Wow. All right, that's 1940 uh, because the Yankee division was activated a year before um, the war started and they had an anti-aircraft section, and that's where they fired from. So that's a, that's, that's a three-inch gun. Next up, this is a 90-millimeter gun. Include this is a picture on, on Camp Edwards. And that was not line of sight. Uh, that was uh, usually by, uh, guided by uh, computers. The larger shells is, is, is allow, allow uses um, the, the shells explode near tar targets and shrapnel in all directions, greatly increasing the likelihood of damage. Judge's case was uh, it did not have enough room for all the fire. Quiet. Now is that me? Is it cutting in and out? Okay. Plan B, okay. <laughs> oh, that's a bad name, isn't it now? I don't mind. Okay. Um, 
So we had, Camp Edwards had a firing range on the base proper. Next. Scort and Neck in Sandwich was an anti-aircraft training firing range. Next. Pompanesset, you ever gone golfing on New Seabury? That's what it looked like in 42, 43. It was an anti-aircraft training range. Next, that's Camp Wellfleet, which is a major firing range. So Camp Edwards, like I said, was one of the, uh, the biggest anti-aircraft training facilities in World War II in the country. Next. This is a night firing shot of Camp Wellfleet. And these are the quad 50 uh, caliber machine guns. And notice, like I said, bullet drop. You see how the, the uh, bullets are arcing down? That's what we call, that's the bullet drop you can see. Now, every trace around you see, Jack, there's seats on the right here, um, is only every fifth round. So there are, for every, every streak you see, there's four other rounds going by. Next. Uh, during World War II, there was a, a um, evolution of aircraft detection devices. Does anybody have a guess as to what this is? It's a hearing device. There's a guy sitting down with tubes going to his ears, and he was usually blindfolded, and he'd turn the ears to the, where it hear the plane, which was especially useful at night. This is pre-radar. So that was, and that's why the searchlight's in coordination with it, because you, uh, you could see a plane during the day, but you couldn't see him at night. Next. And the searchlights, they had a lot of searchlight companies um, at Camp Edwards. Very, very uh, useful thing in the beginning of the war. And overseas, they were quite effective uh, locating German attacks. Next. Then radar came into the picture. Uh, of course, radar was the, uh, the best way of finding a plane because it didn't matter if it was cloudy or dark or whatever. The radar would still pick them up. Although heavy rain, it wasn't uh, as effective. They had um, a job of uh, training aid. Well, that's one of the computers that would figure out where the uh, plane was. Because you had to, it's called a predictor because they'd look at the plane and that would figure out where to shoot to hit the plane by the time the round got there. So that's a very early computer. Uh, one of the great jobs you could get at, camp, uh, at uh, Cape Cod was pulling a target sleeve for guys that were learning how to shoot their weapons. Uh, the Army didn't risk their pilots. They used Civil Air Patrol pilots, and there was a Civil Air Patrol uh, Base 18 was out of the Kuna Messet uh, Airport, which is behind the old Nickelodeon Theater on 151 in Falmouth. That was a grass airfield that was used by the Civil Air Patrol to pull targets in, in uh, World War II. They would fire rockets, and they would slow the rocket down with a little parachute, and they would shoot at the rocket. And finally, they had drones. Uh, here's a picture of drones at Camp Wealthy. And, of course, that was much safer than having a guy pulling a target sleeve. In the, the, the gentleman was talking that they're going to do a, talk about how things are cyclical. This was a top secret operation, having these remote control flying drones. There are Air Force men that are at Otis that fly drones overseas. So they're here and they're flying a drone in Afghanistan. Isn't that weird? In the, you might see a few weird lights over uh, Camp Edwards now. They won't say what it is, but they're, they're the drones. There's drones here too. 
Next. There's a great book, a first-hand account of the anti-aircraft train that went on at Camp Edwards. It's called The 110th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Driving Hitler's Coffin by Lonnie R. Speer. Uh, the recruits received basic uh, army training, including marching, calisthenics, rifle, or obstacle courses. In addition to their anti-aircraft training, a day would start at 0550 and not usually end until 2200 hours, 10 o'clock for you people. Uh, once a week, the men would hike with full pack from Camp Edwards, 13 miles to Scorton Neck, train all day on the guns, then hike back 13 miles to their barracks. They marched 26 miles in one day with 70 pounds of equipment on their back. That's the equivalent of a marathon with 70 pounds of equipment on, in boots. Okay. As in all units, there was always one impish, fun-loving troublemaker. In Lonnie's unit, his nickname was Peter Rabbit. He couldn't remember his real name when he wrote the book. Peter would crack up his fellow soldiers after lights out. He would make wisecracks in a Donald Duck voice, causing the first sergeant to flip his lid. He always seemed to be getting in trouble. The other soldiers thought Peter was so stupid to get in trouble all the time. He would get sent to KP at least once a week. It dawned on Lonnie that Peter Rabbit always got in trouble just before they were to go on their 26 mile hike. <laughs> so one day as he's marching off to his 26 mile hike, he looks out and, and uh, Peter Rabbit's looking at him and smiling as he's peeling potatoes. And he's the one who felt stupid. It may have seemed silly to have the anti-aircraft trainees go through such vigorous infantry training exercises. After all, they would, they would be probably far from the front lines. Many were glad they did get the training. By late 1944, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was reduced to such an extent it was no longer much of a threat. The anti-aircraft troops were turned over to the infantry to become replacements. This is especially true during the Battle of the Bulge. Lonnie Spear was assigned to a 90 millimeter gun crew. The big guns recall and power made Lonnie nervous. He told the captain the gun just plain scares him. His captain reassigned him as a driver of an M4 tractor. Who is it? Is it for me? <laughs> um, they had done countless of uh, tedious dry runs on the base, he even fired a few rounds on the base's artillery range, but now they were headed down Cape to become real ack ack boys. They would set up their guns in a diamond formation, hoping to box in the target. On Tuesday, July 20th, 1943, a fuse from a 90 millimeter shell malfunctioned. The round exploded only 40 yards out of the gun, the shrapnel wounded several soldiers and killed Gunnery Sergeant Joseph Andrews instantly. It put a hole in, Lon in Lonnie's canteen. The 110th went on to have amazing involvement in the big events of the European theater. They protected the D-Day bridgehead. They shot down the first German plane from freed French soil. And they trained right here on Cape Cod. The 110th shot down buzz bombs in Belgium because they had overrun the uh, sites that were hit, hitting London. They had further, more sites inland uh, and they were bombing uh, Antwerp. They were eventually told to stop firing at the buzz bombs as the damaged V1s may fall in the US headquarters that was just behind their position. So they had to let the buzz bombs go kill people in Antwerp because the brass was worried that they would get crippled and come down on them. The bombs were allowed to pass on the way to Antwerp. Spears unit helped stem the German advance during the Battle of Bulge. They helped protect the bridge at Remagen. This is where they saw their first jets. It's a great read. I have a copy over there. I highly recommend it. 
In 2013, I was contacted by the Public Relations Office of Camp Edwards. We knew each other from the displays the Cape Cod Military Museum had put up at some of the base open houses. He had an unusual request. Peter Medcalf, the son of Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Medcalf, former commander of the first composite anti-aircraft demonstration battery Royal Artillery, heh, was visiting America. Peter was retracing some of the steps of his father's unit. There's Tom. And that's at Scorton Neck, that, that photograph. They had shacks and uh, all kinds of stuff. In fact, if you go to Scorton Neck, some of the cottages look funny. They're rectangles, but the doors are on the, the, the long ends of the building because they were originally barracks. Because you'd have a, a long building, you put the door in the front of the long side. So they look funny because they weren't built as cottages. They were one of the, uh, the barracks or the uh, mess halls uh, for Squirt and Neck, and they turned, they turned them into a cottage, but the door's on the wrong side of the uh, building. So you can go see them, they're still there. So the um, first composite uh, was used to promote relations between the British and the US. It was touring America to share the British battle experience, because remember, they had been at war lo much longer than we had. And Camp Edwards, because it was a um, huge anti-aircraft training uh, facility was on its route. The, uh, pup the PR officer was in a bind. He was going to be put on furlough because of a budget crisis during Peter's visit. I communicated with Peter online to get details of the first composite. Uh, the battery was composed of a heavy uh, 3.7 inch gun, a light 40 millimeter gun, a radar troop, radar control searchlight troop. Here they are, Camp Edwards, doing a demonstration. If you notice, they, um, the men all have numbers on their backs. So if you were in the crowd, you could see what you were supposed to do, because you'd have the same number on your crew. And they could get a uh, gun uh, ready to fire in less than three minutes. So there's one of those computers to, uh, to uh, control the, uh, the gun. You can see all the, the uh, US troops watching them. The unit put on firing demonstrations at Scorton Neck Sandwich. Not everything goes perfectly. Here they're having trouble with the fuse setter, and you remember how important that is. So the computer would actually go into that little device, you'd stick the round in, it would set the fuse, and then you'd put the round in the cannon. But if, it's, if it missed up the timing, you, you could get killed because it could go off right after the barrel. Next. You can see them putting in the shell into that round thing. That's the fuse setter which is all based on the primitive computer work as to what altitude uh, the round will go off at. Again, that's Scorton Neck Sandwich. I wonder if there are any noise complaints. <laughs> Next. Here's an article from one of the Cape Cod uh, papers. That's the Herald, actually. Next. Here's a night firing demonstration at Scorton Neck. You think that would get a few complaints now? <laughs> From a 3.7 millimeter cannon going off? Uh, there's a 40 millimeter. And the idea for these photographs actually came from uh, the US press that were covering the uh, tour. And they had the searchlights illuminate the gun so they could get the picture. Next. The searchlights would then make a cone with the lights, and they would fire rounds through the center of the cone. It must have been quite a uh, sight. Speaking of night firing, the Tommies were invited to a dance sponsored by the woman, women's club called the Girls of Taunton. The president of the girls of Taunton 
was a 65-year-old widow. This means she was born in 1878. Her daughter was the vice president of the Girls of Taunton. They interviewed young ladies that wished to join and would decide their worthiness. El Presidente was more like a dictator. The girls were bussed to the dance hall on the base. They were shepherded into the dance hall. And when the dance was finished, the girls were shepherded back to the bus. No Tommy was allowed to leave the hall until the girls were safely away. She even had MPs patrolling the perimeter of the building during the dance. This was the tightest security the first composite would see on its entire trip. <laughs> there were going to be no fuse malfunctions this night. On September 14, 1943, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson visited Camp Edwards. His visit was picked as one of the top stories of the 1943 Camp Edwards newspaper. It was a very big deal. His visit coincided with the first composite. So here he is visiting with the British troops for their anti-aircraft demonstration. The searchlight um, unit was chosen as the honor guard for Secretary Stimson because most of the demonstrations were during the day so the guys could see what you're doing. And so they didn't have much to do. And notice they're wearing their pants. The uh, British uh, first composite was uh, one of the, fought with the desert rats in, in Africa, and they were famous for their shorts. It, uh, whenever they, on the tour, America was a much more conservative um, country at that point. And when the guys walked with their shorts on, they got all kinds of cat calls and ribald uh, comments from the crowd because they were wearing shorts. So here's uh, uh, Secretary Stimson and Tom Medcalf. Again, here they are at the firing range at Scorton Neck. He was duly impressed with their ability. And that concludes the gunpowder part of our lecture. During this day at Camp Edwards, the first composite was invited to participate in a parade and war bond drive. The government had to sell war bonds to the people to finance the conflict. There were many movie stars uh, lending their drawing part of the parade. James Cagney, Judy Garland, Dick Powell, Fred Astaire, Betty Hutton, Mickey Rooney, Harpo Marx, Greer Garson, and Mrs. Miniver fame. Winston Churchill claimed that the film Mrs. Miniver did more for the Allied cause than a flotilla of battleships. Here's Judy. Here they are. And they are wearing their shorts. Stimson's not around. There they are driving down the streets of Boston with a cannon. There's one of the big guns being driven on the street of Boston. And there they are marching, getting cat calls for their shorts. They were warned to stay out of South Boston <laughs> for obvious reasons. Limeys weren't appreciated there. So as they marched, they sang, and they whistled. So one of the songs they would have whistled was this tune from the bridge over River Kwai. So now, if you would all join me. Thank you, that was very good. It's a real lost art. I mean, they, back in the, in the 40s, they were guys whose claim to fame was whistle, whistling songs on the radio. You'd hear people whistle during parts of the song. Uh, I think Chattanooga Choo Choo has a whistling se uh, sequence in it, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, we all know that tune, but that tune had words. If you're ready, you get to read them. <laughs> Hitler has only got one ball goring has two but very small. Himmler is somewhat similar 
But poor Goebbels has no balls at all. So you're welcome for that earworm. You'll have that the rest of your life. Next. They got to meet Governor uh, Saltonstall. Next. There he is with the officers. And here's the book, uh, Invading America. It was written by one of the officers in Tom's unit. Uh, one of the starlets that was there was the young Lucille Ball, and apparently she made a bad impression on him. He, they were not happy with her de demeanor. It was not their first brush with, brush with stardom. So uh, as I was reading the book, they kept uh, mentioning that Gertrude Lawrence had uh, entertained them while they were in Scort and Neck. And I asked myself, who the heck is Gertrude Lawrence? I had never heard of her. But there she is with uh, Stimson and everybody else. I looked at photos of her, was not especially impressed with her beauty. I listened to recordings, not much of a voice. Uh, but they built a 400 seat bleacher for her show at Scort and Neck, just to have her perform once and took it down. So she must have been somebody. Then I saw this picture. And you can see everybody is smitten with her and wants to be near her. She definitely had star power. Well, there's one guy looking at the camera that's more confused. He's very full of himself. But the other guys, you can see how, much, how uh, thrilled they are to be, have her uh, be with her. So I Googled her. And it turns out she was the world's first superstar. She could dance. She, she was Danny Kaye. She gave him his first break. He was a nightclub uh, comedian before she took him on stage. Here she is in the cover of Time. She could sing, act. Gertie had hit songs. She did stellar musical reviews. She performed in movies. Did radio broadcasts. Yeah, she's on life. She did uh, comedic plays, dramatic plays. Her autobiography, A Star Dance, was a bestseller. Gertrude used her experience during touring the country in shows to do the first modern book tour. Before she did it, there wasn't big book tours. She got that going. P.J. Wodehouse wrote the play OK, OK, just for her. George and Ira Gershwin wrote the music for OK, just for her. She was the first person to sing the song Someone to Watch Over Me from OK. Cole Porter, the Gershwin brothers, Rogers and Hamilton all wrote songs for her. Noel Cowell, her childhood friend, wrote plays for her. Here she is with that little Orson Welles guy during private lives. In the 1920s, she was engaged to, to Wall Street banker Bert Taylor, who was the richest man in the world. In the 1930s, she was engaged to Douglas Fairbanks Jr the most handsome man in the world. <laughs> Julie Andrews made a biopic movie about her called Star and almost killed her career. <laughs> it was shot right here in Cape Cod, by the way. But it was sort of a pro-military uh, movie because Gertrude was very pro-military. And it was during the 60, late 60s and a little thing called Vietnam was going on, so pro-war movies didn't do very well. And it's not a very good movie anyways. She, um, did I tell you to advance? 
Did, I, did anybody hear me say next? I don't think. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. She was one of the founders of the Stage Door Canteen. She's in the movie. Stage Door Canteen, in an uncredited role. Her, her movies were Battle of Paris, uh, we all know Funny in Business, Rembrandt, Men Are Not Gods, La Vie Bohème, and Gertie's most famous role. She played a southerner, Amanda, in The Glass Menagerie. Now, the makeup people did such a good job of making her look older and dowdy that her husband insisted on a flashback scene in the movie to show the audience she really didn't look that way. <laughs> because he was concerned her getting more lead roles. Here she is with a little Kurt Douglas in one of his first movie roles. I wrote Mr. Douglas uh, before he died to see if he had any memory of her, but I never got a response. He was the only guy left that had worked with her because he made it to 104. She was a real life Eliza Doodle. She was born dirt poor. And she played Eliza Doodle in revival of the play, Pygmalion, after she convinced the reclusive playwright Bernard Shaw to grant her permission. She, her and her agent wrote him 10 times begging to turn Pygmalion into a musical, but he wouldn't give up the rights. It was turned into a musical. Does anybody know the name of it? My Fair Lady, the biggest musical of all time. So she had a good eye for what would work. Uh, her mom and stepdad would do what's called moonlight flits. Her stepdad would pay off the tab at the grocery store so he could hire their wagon. In the middle of the night, they would move away without paying the rent. Uh, after being kicked out of a musical review, she was a terrific prankster, and she finally got on to, uh, Andre's uh, skin, and he, and he fired her. She was uh, forced to perform at a dinner theater. At this dinner theater, the female cast had to sit at tables with diners for their amusement in between numbers. It was at this club she met Captain Philip Ashley of the Royal Household, Household Cavalry. He was basically her Professor Higgins. He taught her what fork to use, how to address a duchess, etc. She may or may not have had a dalliance with Prince Philip's friend and boss, Edward, Prince of Wales. The Queen Mother did not like her at all. The play she de debuted, OK, Tonight at 830, Susan and Gordon, Skylark, Private Lives, which I saw in Arlene's a number of years ago, uh, that was written for her by her honeymoon uh, friend, her childhood friend, um, Noel Coward. The play is about a divorced couple that, re that happened to honeymoon at the same resort with their new spouses. Uh, Gertrude and Noel played the lead roles. In the supporting role was that hack, Laurence Olivier. <laughs> that was her new husband in the play. Other debuts are Lady in the Dark, September Tides, and The King and I. She was a star in London's East End on Broadway in Hollywood. If she sang a song, the shoot music sales would soar. Women copied her style of dressing. Uh, she came off a yacht in California without wearing silk stockings. Gertie said it was more comfortable and practical. The press was outraged. But this started a bare leg craze. She was Helen Hayes, Madonna, Barbara Streisand, all rolled into one. Gertrude Lawrence was not without her flaws. She was impetuous. Gertie was temperamental and moody. When she was down, she was very hard to work with. 
She earned ridiculous amounts of money, but no matter how much she earned, she spent more. This was detachment from the worth of money may have started when she was dating the richest man in the world. If he had a good day on Wall Street, he'd come home with a $100,000 diamond bracelet. Uh, it was very uh, iffy to give her a compliment on something. A woman in the store said how much she admired her fur coat. Gertie took it off and gave it to her. Okay, so she was extremely generous. Um, she really did not believe in paying tax. The taxes were meant for her. Eventually, her English debtors took her to court. Gertie's finances were taken out of her hands. She was granted an allowance. In order to get out of debt, Gertie worked night and day on both sides of the Atlantic. She then was hit with the fact that she owed the U.S. Treasury for money she earned over here that she didn't pay tax money. In 1939, to pay the, uh, and earn money for the British war relief effort and to pay down her tax lien and to find work out the kinks of her new play, Skylark, Lawrence agreed to perform at the Dennis Playhouse. The Playhouse was owned by Richard Aldrich. A Broadway publicist, publicist sent a list of requirements that Miss Lawrence would require. Fresh flowers every day, lilies being her favorite, chilled French champagne, caviar, etc. The list alarmed and upset Richard. Up here, the cast helped paint the sets and made their own peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> he was very, in a wary mood when he picked her up at the train station. The porters made a mountain out of her luggage before they helped Gertie's maid down the stairs. Oh, while in Washington, D.C., they wouldn't let her maid come into her hotel. So she went and dressed her up and said she was an ambassador from Africa. <laughs> and they let her into the hotel. Uh, luckily for Rich, the list of requirements was what the public the publicist thought Gertie wanted, not request by her. She did love flowers, but her needs were simple. Gertie was fascinated by Richard's reserve and stern Yankee demeanor. He was smitten by her, and they were married on her birthday, the 4th of July, 1940. And there they are, that picture was taken in Dennis on Cape Cod. They bought a house in Dennis. They called it the Berries. She was so famous that there was a postcard of her homestead. Gertrude immensed herself in Cape Cod life. Here's the Berries now. Here she is uh, dry picking cranberries because that was the way it was done back in the day in this publicity photograph, which she got poison ivy from. <laughs> it was also on the cover of Cranberry National Magazine. Uh, Gertie lived her life as she's always acting in a, as in a role in a play. She had been performing since she was six years old. While on holiday with her mom and stepdad, they attended a concert where audience members were invited to come on stage and entertain the crowd. The six-year-old Gertie went on stage and sang a little ditty about a young unwed mother pushing a baby carriage and not knowing who the father of the child was. The act brought down the house. The concert promoter gave Gertie a gold sovereign and she was hooked. At 13, she ran away from home to tour with her hard-drinking, singer-piano-playing father. He sang bass and often performed in blackface. One wonders if she ever knew who she really was or just acted the way she thought a character would act in the situation she was in. She was an air, when, or air raid warden when she was in New York City. She would don her helmet at a rankish angle and go out and looking for violations. On Cape Cod, Gertie uh, joined the Red Cross. She'd roll bandages. She'd, she'd drive her uh, Red Cross car all over the Cape. She picked up any soldier or sailor she saw on foot as she careened about. Driving for the Red Cross also may have been a way for her to get around the gas and tire rationing. Next. It really was okay if Gertie did bend the rules. She raised millions of dollars for the British war relief and did so much for the American war effort. She felt that Richard should also do his prescribed role too. 
When Aldrich bought a house, a country house in Long Island, it was country back then, she felt Richard should become a country gentleman. Gertie brought, bought him a tweed jacket, a pipe, and a shotgun, even though Richard did not wear tweed, smoke, or hunt. Gertie struck gold in uh, January of 1941 with the play Lady in the Dark. This revolutionary musical featured the stage debut of stand-up comedian Danny Kaye. During a dream sequence, uh, he sang a song that rapidly recites the names of Russian composers. He had never been in the theater before. He had been a stand-up comedian. Opening night, the crowd called for three encores of the song. Meanwhile, the star of the show was sitting on a swing waiting, waiting to do her number. Danny did not roll the, know the ins and outs of the, the theater and realized his mistake too late. On the second night, when he was singing his Russian composer song, the crowd started laughing. He looked over to see Gertrude waving a white scarf. The next night, the crowd started to laugh during Gertie's song. Danny, sitting on a huge rocking horse, was making faces at the crowd. Both actors were given orders not to move a muscle when the other one started to sing. Just before Danny was to sing, Gertrude, Gertie struck a match, sat perfectly still as the match burned down to her fingers. And of course, the crowd would watch the match and not rather than listen to his song. At this point, Mr. K stopped his song, bowed to Miss Lawrence. The, he had given up. The fight was over. She had won the, the performance feud. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Richard Aldridge joined the Navy as lieutenant. Gertie was thrilled. Gertrude decided that Richard should become a naval war hero, even though his expertise was in logistics, and he was very prone to seasickness. Her attitude was that Admiral Nelson got seasick and did not stop him. Gertrude, because of her celebrity fundraising, was always hobnobbing with generals and admirals. It is thought that she let an admiral know how much Richard longed for the sea. <laughs> he was soon assigned to the story of Maddox. The ship was being built and outfitted at the New York, uh, in New York City at the Brooklyn Naval Shipyard. Gertie ad adopted the boys of the crew and they adopted her as the ship's pinup. They had a photograph of her from the back, and they would slap her rump on the pinup poster for good luck as they headed toward their battle stations. Richard suffered from severe sickness during the Maddox Sea Trials. His illness, illness and the need for competent manager and supply equaled Aldrich being sent back to shore. The Maddox was still their ship. Gertie was in charge of the ship's going away party. She rented a hall, provided the food, and even had Frank Sinatra come over and sing a few songs as part of the entertainment. The Maddox was part of a fleet for the invasion of Sicily. On July 10th, 1943, the Maddox was virtually blown in two by German Ju-88 bombers, with 218 lives lost. Wartime mail being what it was, Gertrude received thank you letters for her going away party from deceased crewmen for weeks after the Maddox sinking. This was the saddest and most heartbreaking occurrence for Gertie during the war. Why did Gertrude Lawrence want to do so much for the soldiers? She got a big break in showbiz in 1916. She was invited to be an understudy and work in the chorus of musical review produced by Andre Cholet. Problem, the struggling actress did not have the funds to get to London. A fellow actress was dating a soldier. He took up a collection of his mates, and Gertie was off to London with money to spare. The soldiers were on leave from the front. They returned to France just in time for the Battle of the Somme. The British had 50,000 casualties 
in the first day of the battle. None of the troops that loaned her money returned. She always felt she owed a debt to those soldiers. She wanted to do her part for the war and its attained troops. In World War II, while on Cape Cod, she set up the Gertrude Lawrence Wing of the American Theater Association. Very entertaining. No matter how short the soldiers' stay on Cape Cod was, they would, actors would perform for them. She set up the Gertrude Lawrence Mobile Lending Library and Gift Shop. She took an old ambulance and filled it with books and small items to visit soldiers in remote outposts all over the Cape. She responsored a recording van so soldiers could send a voice message home. This is Ensa. There are many children that the only time they can remember hearing their father's voice was on that 45 that was sent home from that van. In 1944, the Richards already overseas, Gertrude finally was able to secure a passage to England. This is where she wanted to be since the war begun. She had entertained troops in World War I and knew there was no better audience. Gertrude was based in London. She traveled all over England entertaining troops, touring as part of ENSA, E-N-S-A, Entertainment's National Service Association. The troops came up with their own meaning of ENSA, abbreviation, every night something awful. <laughs> Between entertaining the troops, she had returned to her hotel in London. The city at this time was being pounded by V-1 buzz bombs. Several times a night, the 850-kilo-pound 800, uh, explosives charged would blow up parts of the city to smithereens. One rainy night, she counted 17 buzz bomb hits, because remember, the radar wasn't good at detecting them in the rain. There were 23,000 uh, wounded by buzz bombs, 6,000 killed. And we all remember how two 20-pound bombs shot down the, shut down the city of Boston uh, not too long ago here. Could you imagine having there's over a million build, buildings damaged by the buzz bombs. So that keep calm and carry on thing, the British did that. The windows of her hotel were blown out. Gertrude was performing her act for the sailors aboard the HMS Collinwood, salt, sultry singing what a lovely way to spend an evening when she noticed her husband Richard sitting in the front row with the officers. She almost missed her cue. Gertie's troop was one of the first to land in France. It was a hot July day. Her LST pulled up next to an American LST 767. Is an LST. Do anybody know what LST stands for? No. Low, large, slow target. Large, slow target. That's the correct answer. The ships had to wait for the tide to, uh, uh, to unload. The Americans dared Gertie to swim to shore. She said she would, but had no bathing suit. The Yanks pulled off the underwear of a rather rotund sailor and tossed them to her. Gertie borrowed the bra of a fellow trooper of ample bosom and swam ashore. Later in the war, the sailors of the American LST wrote to Mrs. Lawrence asking her for the boxers back. They wished to fly them from the ship's mast. <laughs> Gertie had long, dispo long ago disposed of the boxers. She sent them a pair of pink panties with the instructions to keep them flying until she could fill them. Once ashore, Gertie's troop performed admirably putting on shows even in the harshest of conditions. They performed the show with debris of war all around them. One image that really stood out in Gert Gertie's mind was of an old woman standing in the middle of her devastated home. In her hand, the French woman clutched a feather duster. 
God knows what she thought she could do with it, but a woman's instinct told her she must do something. But what? Where? The smell of dead animals and humans, swarms of flies, lack of sanitation, poor food, no power, and German shelling in the distance were all things they had to endure. But it was a bad case of dysentery and exhaustion that finally drove Gertrude back to London to recuperate. Gertrude was so weak that she was sent back to Cape Cod for recovery. After resting on the Cape, if you call cleaning the gutters and painting the shutters on the berries resting, Gertrude joined the USO. She told Richard that she would do a tour of camp hospitals in the United States. This, of course, was a, a lie. Off to the Pacific in a B-24 to entertain troops and sailors, Marines and Seabees for the USO. She performed on Guam, Tinian, Saipan. On Saipan, Saipan, a tropic downpour erupted during the performance. The Marines, some of which had not seen a woman in three years, did not budge. They sat under the ponchos in the mud. A little later, the lights and microphone went out. The Marines switched on their flashlights. Gertie finished the show sopping wet. She did have one bad experience on her tour. Everything was going swell when she announced she was going to do a song called Brooklyn. 3,000 voices screamed, no, no, no. She thought they were just being cheeky and started the song. The crowd uh, screamed and hooted and drowned her out. She said, well, that's it, boys, and stalked off the stage. She was shaking with anger and fear. An MP stopped her to explain there was nothing to do with her. The camp commander was from Brooklyn, and he played that song over the PA hundreds of times, and the men were sick of it. <laughs> she returned to the stage and took requests. She did them all except for Jenny. Gertrude Lawrence was closely identified with the play Lady in the Dark. After the show in Guam, Gertie was escorted to an airstrip. There in the moonlight was a brand new C-47 cargo plane. On the plane's nose in huge red and black letters read Lady in the Dark. Gertrude uh, christened the plane with a beer. There was a problem being identified with Lady in the Dark. There is a racy number called Jenny in the play. Insistent calls for Jenny were interfering with her shows. The USO had banned the song. There was a section in the song which included bumps. <laughs> so, the, uh, the USO relented finally and said she could do the song, but without the bump. Gertrude complained to the Pentagon, where she knew people because of her uh, association with raising funds. And the Pentagon took time out of their busy schedule in World War II to rule that Miss Lawrence may do bumps provided she did them sideways. <laughs> but she would often demonstrate, I can't do them like this, I have to do them like this. So she worked the bumps into the, into the numbers. Gertrude stopped doing two shows a night so that she might visit more hospitals. Gertie appointed herself mailman. She would get the address of wounded soldiers, wives, mothers, or girlfriend, and write a short personal letter about her visit. On Waikiki uh, Beach, sunbathers noticed a, a, a black object protruding from and moving through the waters offshore. The Navy Guard was alerted. A plane was dispatched to check out the small periscope repairing device. The plane swooped low and then returned to base. It was Gertrude Lawrence trying out the newly invented mask and snorkel. <laughs> In her island, island hopping tour, Gertie entertained 150,000 US personnel. She was Cape Cod's own Bob Hope. Gertrude Lawrence's final act was a crowning achievement. 
She acquired to the rights to Anna and the king of Siam. With the reluctant help of Rogers and Hammerstein, it was turned into the musical The King and I. Rogers and Hammerstein thought she sang flat and did not have much range, both true. There she is with them. She selected the then unknown Yule Brenner to be the king sight unseen. She was behind a curtain and heard his addition. Nobody's head higher than king. And she put her head through and said, that's him. Gertie felt the first act of play was missing something in the initial run um, in, in Connecticut and they, in their run in Boston. She noticed there was a large gap in the singing. And by the way, Rogers and Hammerstein gave the, the tough songs to the other p women in the, in the troupe. Uh, she didn't sing any tough songs. Um, she had Rogers and Hammerstein add a musical number, getting to know you for the end of the first act. Getting to know you was inspired by an actual event in her own life. Early in the war, Gertrude had arranged to have the children of London's actors off orphanage brought to America for their safety. She met with and welcomed the children before sending them out to their host families. In fact, she and Richard hosted two boys for a summer. She won the Tony Award for a role as Anna for the year 1951. In August of 52, she became ill. On September 4th, she entered the hospital. Her last request was that the Marquis put Yule Brenner's name on top. Gertrude Lawrence died of liver cancer, September 6, 1952. She was buried in the dress she wore when she played Anna in the Aldridge family plot in Upton, Mass. Her funeral was huge. They dimmed the lights of the East End, Broadway, and Hollywood at the, at the time of her funeral. Richard Aldridge's biography of Gertie as his wife, Gertrude Lawrence as Mrs. A, published after her death, became a bestseller. We all owe Gertrude Lawrence our thanks, for it is she that started, and have all been there, the Cape Cod Melody Tent. She was in Florida and saw a tent for sale and bought it. Here she is with her agent during the raising of the uh, first Melody Tent. She and her husband built the Falmouth Playhouse. She and Richard took over the South Shore Music Circus and built that institution up. She was instrumental in bringing Broadway acts to Cape Cod. The rich theater tradition we have today is part of her legacy. No one knows her because she died before TV became a thing. She was on the Ed Sullivan Show before it was the Ed Sullivan Show. There were only 500 TVs in New York City to receive that show. It was, uh, her audience saw her live and that was her strongest thing because the energy she had, she had it. You would follow her on stage. But as they passed away, they took their memory of her with them. So she's an unknown superstar. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Questions and comments? Yes, sir. Well, 
I believe they had a super long range condor that could theoretically have made it over. Jack, did they actually have some come over? Yeah, but not, not, a, not a lot, not carrying bombs or anything. Yeah. Yeah. But no warplane ever would have shot down. Oh, you know, not here. Right, right, no. No, right. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Yes? There was a there was a diesel generator. That was off. The cables would run to it. It's, it's usually off to the side because it's loud and everything. But yeah, no, it's a, it was, it, it was, the war spurred things along. The first jet, the first computer, a lot of military applications. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it wasn't where it was now. It was. Uh, Jerry, do you know remember where the uh, high school road Main Street? Yeah, it was high school road and Main Street, so I, I don't it, it didn't rotate. <laughs> so I don't know I don't know what the layout was, but it probably could have been used for plays. And uh, Broadway, you know, with the air conditions, stuff like that, that was a slow time for them. So she'd get a lot of her friends to come up um, here and uh, perform up here because she was so famous, she had this drawing power to bring all those people in. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. So was a, uh, a, a actress from the 30s and 40s whose name I can't remember. She came to the Cape several years ago, and she was doing a show with just herself, you know, looking back at the 40s and all that. And during her show, they stirred up some air, and a little piece of paper fluttered down from the uh, overhead on stage. Yeah, the Dennis Playhouse. Yeah, that, yeah. They say she haunts that. <laughs> That's that Playhouse. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Well, it's World War One. World War One. Yeah. Yeah. New Orleans. New Orleans. Yep. Yeah. But they had. German naval prisons of wars doing laundry in Chatham. Yeah, and they had 5,000 Africa Corps prisons of war in Camp Edwards and in tents in Mashpee. I guess they let them run there, they didn't care. <laughs> and they actually, the uh, prisons of war, were, were, you could rent them out to do uh, pick crops, cranberries, uh, and during, the, after the hurricane of 44, they brought in seven million uh, yards of, lum of lumber from all the downed trees, and they cut them in six sawmills they had running on the base. And you get paid for the trees they took out, and they paid the Germans to do the work. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. So, grab a snack and come back and take a look at some of the stuff we have set up. Thank you.